Good morning or good afternoon or indeed good evening uh, wherever you are in the UK and welcome to this online training course on the key species of dry acid grassland and heathland. My name is Dominic Price and I'm going to be running through uh, roughly 20 species uh, that are quite charismatic uh, of this of this habitat. We're going to focus on the species which are included as part of the National Plants Monitoring Scheme and uh, yeah to cover these two set you know slightly separate but actually very transitional habitats um, which we'll look at at a bit more detail now. So we'll start off with acid grassland and here's a nice picture of some acid grassland in the new forest and have a look at some of the general characters which cover this habitat. So acid grassland and indeed heathland which we're going to get onto next it typically occurs on soils derived from sandstones and igneous rock. So the key thing that we're lacking here is any of the chalk or the limestone which is so prevalent in other parts of the UK. Because of the soil being derived from sandstones, often this habitat can actually be extremely sandy. You often see it when you get footpaths or trackways going through and you can actually see where the sand is just eroding straight off um, the bedrock. And because of this, it pushes the pH of the soil down into these acidic uh, regions. It's normally, it's not sort of massively acidic, but even, you know, the smallest drop below seven starts uh, having this really profound influence on the sort of plants which grow there. The thing you often spot when you drive into these habitats, first of all, or, or walking into them, is that the tree cover tends to change quite dramatically over to pine and birch woodland, and you see plants like bracken in the understory. You still get oak woodland on acid soils, but it tends to be, yeah, this sort of shift towards quite a different feeling uh, to the vegetation. Now acid grassland is an interesting habitat because the pure form of it is typically very species poor. Now this is in really marked contrast to calcareous grassland where the best examples of calcareous grassland are incredibly rich. So calcareous grassland, uh, if it, you know, really top quality stuff, you can be looking at you know up to 40 species per square meter so very very diverse acid grassland uh you know in very pure stands of it you can sometimes be lucky to find uh more than five species the variation you tend to get is where you get changes in management and where you get changes in drainage and hydrology so if you start getting into damper areas of it you get a different suite of species but in terms of sort of pure dry acid grassland it's not very species rich and in a way this can make it appear quite dull sometimes. Um, what you tend to get is few, uh, very few flowering species and I've written here tightly defined and the tightly defined is that they're, it's so typically the same species that you find again and again. With calcareous grass and there can be um, much more sort of variation within it so um, you know between the chalk grasslands and the limestone grasslands and you get uh, these very dense sward grasslands and narrow sward grasslands so you get quite a range of uh, different species popping in and popping out. Acid grassland um, you tend to see so much of um, particularly tormentil and heath bedstraw tend to be your kind of faithful two that occur everywhere you then you know you get a bit more diversity popping in, in as the habitat slightly changes and I think for that reason it's tempting to sort of think of it as a slightly boring habitat compared with you know the flower rich sort of orchid meadows of the chalk but in fact acid grassland it, it's possibly one of our rarest habitats it's super 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 rare and the reason is uh, it's very prone to both damage in terms of historically a lot of it has been limed to bring the pH up and make it more productive obviously a fair bit of it has been ploughed up but mostly it it will only survive when it's very tightly grazed um, so it's almost the definition of it is a tightly grazed grassland because if it stops being grazed it tends towards becoming other habitats so it's almost like acid grassland is desperate to either become heathland or become scrub or become gorsed over um, it, and it, it needs to be kind of kept at that low level so in a way it's a very artificial habitat although of course it tends to occur in quite wild places um, you know you don't tend to ever it's rare to get it in enclosed fields it tends to be in unenclosed uh, 
large commons and so forth. So it's a very interesting habitat, but it's um, possibly what you might call an acquired taste. I think a lot of people would walk into it and think, oh, you know, this is quite dull. And, you know, if you look at this photo here, you can see if you took the heather out of the equation, uh, you are looking more or less at lots of grass. But actually, it's one of those very rewarding habitats when you look closer at it you start seeing a lot more. And the final thing to say here is that it occurs in unusual places. So obviously, you know, in places like the New Forest, and we'll look at some of the areas where you find it in a bit, um, you get these vast expanses of it. But anywhere, the soil is slightly acid. So sometimes on clay, you can get patches of acid grassland. And often, actually, it, it pops up in weird sort of post-industrial places. So, um, I mean, the weirdest place I've ever seen it was at a glass factory. It was a very old factory, and they'd been um, getting rid of all the sort of tailings. I mean, essentially, they were making the glass back into sand, so all the waste glass was powdered up and put on these piles, and on the edge of it, acid grassland had been uh, forming, uh, and I've seen it on sort of concrete places. And, yeah, it's an unusual one, so it's worth kind of keeping an eye on, eye out for, and it's really worth knowing these species which exist within it. So in terms of its location, the kind of real stronghold of uh, this is the, you know, the lowland acid grass. And I'm, I'm not a huge expert on the upland habitats, but the big areas it occurs in it is in the Brex, uh, in the New Forest and the Dorset Heaths and the Wealdon Heaths uh, on the sort of Sussex, Surrey uh, border. Um, but as I say, also in a huge array of other locations, you know, small bits of it pop up. So that is acid grassland. And as I say, you can see there the heather and you can see bits of the heathland net. So then we move into heathland. So the general characters, uh, so very similar, it's on these infertile free draining soils. In other words, this is a dry habitat. Um, this is actually the definition of lowland heath, it tends to be up to 300 metres. You obviously have upland heath then forms above that. It's a dynamic habitat which requires management to maintain. So again, like the acid grassland, heathland will always tend towards being other habitats. It will tend towards scrub, it will tend towards sort of secondary birch woodland. And good heath, uh, even, you know, the heather can be a problem. And you can see this photo here. This is down on the Dorset heaths. You can just see Shell Bay and Bournemouth in the background. Um, but you can see in this patch, the heather's got very old, it's got very leggy, and the diversity has dropped. So it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, there's a real skill of heather management. An awful lot of it in the uplands and in the north of England is uh, pretty much purely managed for shooting. And that comes with its own challenges. You know, it's good in terms of it creates, they, they're very sort of into creating uh, different diversity of heather. But however, there's all sorts of other problems with, uh, you know, they have a very kind of narrow vision of, of keeping it for those game birds and not much else. So, yeah, lots and lots of challenges associated with that. So it includes a wide range of subtypes. Um, so here you have shingle heath, dune heath and maritime heath. These are the dry heaths. So if you're on the coast, you can get rather kind of different um heathlands. You, you may, you know, if you've ever spent time in the dunes, it's always a bit of a surprise when you find heather growing in dune slats but you do get it there so there's quite a sort of range within that and general location so again this is looking at lowland heath so southern england from the lizard to the breckland with strongholds in dorset new forest and the thames basin heaths um, and then a good sort of smattering up in the midlands so cannock chase being the big one but actually uh, lots and lots of small heaths in sort of in the staffordshire area and so forth and then it's pretty well distributed in uh, Wales, both sort of upland heath and lowland heath. And yeah, it's dotted around the place. But certainly, you know, if you want to see it in its in its peak, then the New Forest and the Dorset Heaths are a good place to be heading for. So we're going to look at about 20 species uh, which are on the NPMS, which are the things which are good indicators. What I've done for this course is uh, I think I've broadly done it in alphabetical order starting off with the grasses and what I've done at the bottom is put the NPMS habitat that they belong to. Now I would say all of these are quite interchangeable. So here we've got sweet vernal grass, anthoxanthum odoratum, which you also get in heathland. So you know we I've put the sort of nominally the labels at the bottom 
but um, yeah, you just need to be aware there's quite a sort of crossover. There's kind of three key things to look for with sweet fernal grass. The first thing is uh, a structure called the oracle. So the oracle is where the leaf comes down and touches the blade. And you can see where it meets it, there's this really sort of uh, like a row of sort of whiskers coming off it. So you've got an oracle, but that oracle has whiskers on it. There's another grass called um, heath grass, Danthony decumbens, which is not in the NPMS. And with that one, you get much more sort of individual long hairs coming off. It's very different in flower, but just be aware vegetatively there's a muddle. The second thing about sweet vernal grass is if you pull up a small bit of it and have a sniff of the roots, you should get this very intense sweet smell. So it's, uh, yeah, it's somewhere between disinfectant and essence of almond, which I know sounds like two very different things. Uh, I think it's partly a perception thing. Personally, I find it very almondy, uh, but having done lots of courses and got everyone to sniff it, I think the majority of the population tend to talk about disinfectant or deep heat smell almost. Um, and then weirdly, some people find it very unpleasant. It has a real kind of reaction on them. So yeah, it's been very interesting to observe over the years, lots of people smelling it. And uh, yeah, I think smell is obviously a very sort of personal thing between people. Anyway, that's a complete tangent. Um, has quite short leaves and they're quite shiny below. Again, sort of be aware if you're in slightly degraded uh, acid grassland and you've got, say, perennial rye coming in a bit more, that they can both look a bit shiny. But these, uh, yeah, and sweet vernal definitely. And you can see in the picture these sort of short, almost sort of spear-like leaves. And, uh, yeah, the flowers are short spikes. They're very, very, very early. So um, sweet vernal, obviously vernal meaning of the spring. So uh, you will start seeing them, you know, pretty much from the start of April onwards. So quite a long time before some of the other grasses. And the only thing to be aware of this, I mean, I, I always think of them as spiky sausages. And they start off very sort of close up and spike like. But can you see in the big photo, they then do open up. And those ones, you can see them flowering. You can see the stamen and the stigmas hanging out. And then they close up again. So just be aware there's this slight sort of variation within the spike. But yeah, very, very spiky, spiky heads made out of spiky bits. So yeah, definitely a spikiness to that. The next one we're going to look at is wavy hair grass. So in flower, pretty unmistakable because it has these absolutely beautiful heads. If you're familiar with tufted hair grass, um, you... Uh, yeah, this is something you'll probably, you'll recognise that sort of similarity of these very, very showy heads. And with wavy hair grass, because the heads are very delicate, I always think of them as very much sort of waving around in, in the wind. Um, they also, if you look just beneath where the flowers are, and you can just see it on some of the stems in that picture, they can have these really sort of wibbly wobbly stems. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but if you can, I'm just pointing to the stem on the left and you can see the wiggles in that. And I never know if it's named wavy because of those waves there or the fact that the whole thing waves in the wind, but actually it does both, which is great. So those both sort of um, work. Now, if you don't have the flowers, little bit tricky. So unfortunately in, in heathland and acid grassland, there's quite a few needly grasses. If you're in chalk and neutral and you find a needly grass, it's very likely to be a fescue. In heathland and acid grass, I think because they're such dry habitats, they're full of lots and lots of species which have evolved um, needly leaves, which is a classic kind of evolutionary way of coping with drought. Um, so one of the things you want to look for, the first thing about it is they're quite sort of um, lax and floppy. They're certainly not really sticking upright. They tend to droop down. Um, and once you've sort of got a little bit of experience with them, you will appreciate they've got a very waxy, waxy smooth feel to them. So some of the other needly grasses can almost be quite sort of rough, whereas this one is very waxy. And it really sort of doesn't have much of a ligule at all compared with there's another species called bristlebent, Agrostis curtisii, which has a whopping great ligule. So if you look again, this is where the leaf joins the stem you won't see much of a ligule on that one. 
The other thing to note here is that unfortunately it has changed its Latin name, which is just one of these things which happens with these species from time to time. So if you've got one of the new books, it is now called Aval Avanala. Yeah, Avanala, 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 one of those. Uh, Flexiosa. It's still wavy hair grass. Uh, I think on the NPMS book it's possibly done as dysampsia, or it may be me being naughty here and using the old name, but um, yeah. If that's confusing, you just call it wavy hair grass because that has stayed the same. Now, staying with the needly grasses, we now have another needly grass. Now, superficially, you say, oh, this is another needly grass. It's a bit fiddly, but actually this is dramatically different to uh, the wavy hair grass because with this one, matte grass, Nada stricta, if you rub a patch of it, it feels like a doormat. And you can see in that picture, and you remember how I said with wavy hair grass that it's quite sort of droopy and lax. Look at the way these leaves, um, they, they stick up in such a kind of abrupt manner. So there's a big difference there in that, in that general appearance. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, one of the very cool things this has is it's very, very highly adapted to grazing, and particularly sheep grazing. And if you look at that photo at the top, you can see that half the leaves kind of stick up in quite a normal way that you'd expect for a grass, but the other half come out at a very, very dramatic 90 degree angle. And what that means is particularly in sheep grazed habitats, when the sheep come over and they nibble the tops off, the mat grass is absolutely fine. It almost kind of thrives on that level of grazing. And as a result, mat grass is becoming very, very problematical um, in, in a lot of upland areas. Um, I remember doing some hill walking in the Brecon Beacons a while back and going up the side of Penny Fan. And, I, and the, um, yeah, the last sort of 100 metres of the walk, it was pretty much just mat grass, like literally no other plants whatsoever. And that's years and years of sheep grazing um, have just made this the dominant species. Um, it, it doesn't fare so well with cattle and sort of where I am here near the new forest you don't see much of it at all because of course cattle the way they graze is they pull stuff out of the ground rather than shearing it off and that sort of gets on top of it quite quickly. And the final thing to say in terms of ID is if you've got it in flower, uh, yeah the flowers resemble these sharp black whips so very very fine, very black and glossy, glossy and yeah nothing, nothing really like that at all. So that's kind of three key grasses to be looking out for in both of those habitats. Um, certainly mat grass is, is much more acid grass than, than heath, but you sometimes, you know, if you get open areas in amongst heather, you will find it. So moving on to the heathers. Now I think we've got two heathers which form part of the NPMS and actually I'm throwing in a third one because I wanted to show it to you just for comparison. Um, I think you probably all know heather, but just be aware of the, you know, if you do get it not in flower, the leaves, they're quite weird, the leaves of heather, because you don't really see a leaf as such. You tend to sort of most see these sort of leafy protuberances. Um, they're very tightly clustered together and you tend to get, um, they almost sort of come up in four rows up the leaf. But um, yeah, it's quite it's quite a sort of complex structure, but it does look dramatically different from the other heathers. The thing to say about Coluna vulgaris heather is that it's probably the broadest ranged of all the heathers. So um, it does pretty well in dry heath. It it does all right in the wet, and sometimes you find it you know in really damp blanket bogs. It's still doing quite well. Uh, and yeah, it sort of sits very happily in the middle. And you can see here that it's in both lists. And again, this is typical of the transition between these habitats. And really, in a way, the only real difference between acid grass and heath is the heather. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a certain percentage cover of heather, depending on what um, habitat methodology you're doing, it becomes heathland. But uh, it can sometimes be a very fine line. If you've got big clumps of heather in amongst grass, and whether you just say, you know, this is a heathy bit of grassland, or is it a grassy piece of heathland? You know, and, it, and this is really down to just management, the levels of grazing and so forth. Uh, and just to say, Heather, the, the, on this one, the, the flowers are very small, but of course, because of the sheer quantity of them, they can turn entire sort of landscapes purple. If you know, you particularly see that in the Scottish 
highlands where you know around august and september with whole mountain ranges turning purple so um yeah it's impressive by its by its quantity the next heather we're going to look at is bell heather uh, now bell heather slightly confusingly called erica cinerea cinerea meaning gray and actually that yeah, it's a bit of an odd one because this isn't particularly grey. But look at the leaves on this. They're very, very needly. Um, and this sort of gives you a slight clue as to its habitat, which is much, much drier. So this is very much an indicator of dry acid grassland, dry heathland. Much bigger flowers. I think there's possibly not as many of them, but they're huge and they do look like bells. And that's where the name comes from. But the really key thing with that is looking at these this needly grassland. Now that quite neat, neatly leads on to Erica tetrix, which I believe, I hope I've got this right, is not on the MPMS list. Now, and partly because this is very much an indicator of wet heathland, you're, you're very much into a different habitat. But look at the leaves on this one. So quite needly, but certainly not like needles you've got in bell heather, but they're beautifully arranged into these whirls of four. Um, now the confusing thing about it is when you look at the whole clump of it, it looks very, very gray, uh, but it's not the one with the Latin name saying gray, which has always caused me much of a muddle. However, this one's got a lovely Latin name, Erica tetralix, uh, and that relates to these four um, leaves coming up in whirls. And the leaves are very impressive because they've got a, the, well, the whole plant has this sort of downy hairiness on it, but the leaves as well have these gland tipped hairs on them. Um, and yeah, the, and, the, and the point of these being, it makes it very hard for, for weevils and other sort of plant boring insects. Plant boring insects almost <laughs> it makes them sound very dull. Uh, yeah, these are, these are insects which bore into plant material, not bore it to death. Uh, so yeah, gland tipped hairs, which just frustrate these insects when they try and crawl up it, it makes it very heavy going for them. So therefore they can't sort of work their way through these plants. Again, you see these rather sort of bell like flowers, but much, much lighter pink, very light color. And the final thing to just to say, if you're in Dorset and Cornwall and even sort of just in possible in Hampshire, just be aware of Cornish heath and Dorset heath. Uh, which look pretty different, they're quite rare, but it's worth keeping an eye out for them. We then move on to... Actually, I apologise, this is not in alphabetical. What I've done is is I've sort of dealt with some of the common families to start off with. So I've done the heathers there, um, the ericaceous shrubs, and now we're moving into the pea family. So a key pea plant of heathlands is Lotus corniculata, common bird's foot trefoil. So the three things to look out are for here are your trefoil of leaves. So rather sort of clover-like, but instead of with clovers, you get this sort of rounded end to them. So with bird's foot trefoil, much more pointed. Um, the flowers have this quite cool coloration. So this is very much in its yellow form, but when they first come out in bud, they tend to um, have this sort of reddy brown tinge and this leads to the common name of eggs and bacon. It's slightly tenuous, the eggs and bacon, but you can sort of see it from the red color of the um, of the early flowers. Maybe bacon used to be a lot redder than it, than it is these days. Um, and then once it's gone over, uh, well not gone over, once it's fruited and formed the pods, um, you get this bird's foot shape, so you have these three sort of claws coming out, sometimes with a bit of a sort of hooked talon at the end of them, uh, and that's where the name comes from. And just to say with this one, if, um, so I've done a terrible misspelling of Harrier, I've spelt as Harrier, which is quite interesting. Um, yeah, so greater bird's foot trefoil is a much larger one. It is Harrier, or Harrier, as we might say, and it has hollow stems. So if you find a bird's foot trefoil and you think, oh, that's very hairy looking, give the stem a little squeeze. You can do it in a way that doesn't kill the plant. And if, the, if it really sort of gives way and you can feel like it's hollow, you've possibly got greater bird's foot trefoil. So that is one to look out for. Next, we move on to this very cool member of the pea family, Ornitho Ornithopus purpusilus, bird's foot. Now, again, confusing name because often when I do this on training courses and I say bird's foot and people say, well, do you mean bird's foot trefoil? And it's like, no, it is just bird's foot. 
uh, it's hard to stress just how small this photo is. So that photo of the flower was taken through a times 20 macro lens. Absolutely beautiful flower. I think possibly one of the most beautiful flowers in the UK flora, but it's only about uh, two to three millimetres wide. It is absolutely teeny. Um, you can see in the bottom of the photo these seed pods, and they're very cool. They're kind of in um, capsules. So instead of getting one sort of smooth, continuous pod, you get this sort of... Um, it's hard to say what it's like, really, almost like a sort of a, a pearl necklace in a way with the different um, compartments for each seed. Um, the leaves are uh, very much this sort of pinnate uh, form with the different leaves on each side, a little bit reminiscent of horseshoe vetch, if you're familiar with that, but very, very small. Now, I have added at the bottom, when you get it, um, if it grows somewhere where there's a bit more... Uh, moisture and if it's in the shade it can get bigger but certainly uh, in well grazed habitats it is absolutely minute and I think it partly survives because of its size it's just so small that it doesn't attract much attention from um, grazers so uh, yeah it's a really really lovely one to look out for and if you're into photography and particularly macro photography uh, you can have great enjoyment um, photographing the flowers I just love the um the venation on the, the top petal is just absolutely glorious. It makes you think what insect it's aimed at, because you'd have to be an absolute minute insect to fit into the flower. But they definitely, you know, put the work in to make their flowers attractive. We then move on to gorse. Now, I'm sure you all know gorse. I don't need to say much about it. This is uh, gorse, sometimes, you know, called common gorse, Ule Ulex europaeus. Uh, it's the big one. Um, so... Uh, often I think it can go up to two meters tall, you know, and it almost sort of forms trees. If you've if you've ever done gorse removal as part of habitat management on mature gorse, it's proper, you know, it's almost sort of chainsaw work getting through some of the trunks. It's a big, big old thing, um, but you know, very wonderful, very profusely flowering. It's a good pollen and nectar source. However, it, it it is one of the sort of big threats to heathland that once it gets into a heathland, it, it if a heathland isn't managed, it will take over. And obviously when it forms a thick cover and with all the spines falling to the ground and rotting, it will pretty much knock out other species. Plus it is moderately unpleasant if you ever have to take a shortcut through it. Um, in terms of identifying it from there, obviously other gorses, which we're going to look at in the next slide, uh, the next slide but one, um, the spines on this one, not only they're very long, up to two and a half centimetres, but they're ridged. And you can just see that in the top photo. You can see it on the stem and you can just see it on the spines that they've got very, very noticeable ridges on it. So that's something to look for. I mean, I think in fairness, most of the time you find it, it's so big, you kind of instantly know what it is. But if you have a smaller one, this is the thing to look for. I would also add it is definitely the spinest of all the gorses in terms of walking through it. One little thing to add with gorse is this. This is what a gorse seedling looks like. And uh, it's a really tricky one, this, but of course the books don't tend to cover seedlings. And, you know, nor would they because it's a nightmare. It's hard enough identifying mature plants without adding this into the equation. But this one is interesting because the seeds are so, so different. Sorry, the seedlings are so, so different from the grown up plant. Now you can sort of see... This is taken beneath the gorse because can you see the old the old spines and, and twigs and stuff rotting on the floor? But this has um this used to absolutely fox me doing quadrats on Heathland and finding this thing and thinking, well, I, you know, I'm pretty sure it's a pea. It's got that sort of general pea trifoliate feel to it. But what peas are trifoliate? What peas are this hairy? And you look through the book for sort of hairy peas and it leads you down a complete sort of wrong turn of all sorts of things and then it pretty much takes someone else uh to have a look at your photo and go oh yeah that's gorse and they pass on the ancient wisdom of gorse seedling identification which i am now passing on to you so yeah if you ever find something like this uh it will generally be near an adult gorse or near where they've done gorse clearance but um yeah it's a really good one to know about two other types of gorse uh, and these, I will be honest with you, these can be tricky. Western gorse, by the nature of it being Western gorse, uh, has a Western distribution. So, you know, it's going to be something which you're going to be finding quite a lot in 
Dorset and Devon and West uh, Wales on the West Coast. Um, so you don't need to worry about it in the, in the, the sort of Far East, as I call Norfolk. Um, there's differences in the flower structure, which I'm not going to get into today because it's complicated. And even when I've sat down with the specimens, it, it, it's a tricky one to work out for. The, the key thing with these two is they don't have the um, ridged spines. I mean, dwarf course, they're faintly ridged, but they're nothing like as ridged as common. Uh, one of the key things I use for this one, dwarf course, when you have a new shoot coming out, you can actually stroke it. So the first bit of growth is really quite soft and it, it sort of has the spines on but it's almost like they haven't filled out they're like sort of soft soft strokey spines so that's quite a good way of telling them apart but uh yeah it's fiddly i mean dwarf is slightly smaller but western is quite small so um but the main thing is you know don't identify them as common and then get the book out and have a good old look i think if you've got really good flowers you can then sort of have a look at this flower structure difference and, and do it that way. So um, it's doable, but it's just a bit involved. So then we move on to the daisy family. Now, I've actually only got one member here of the daisy family, which is slightly disappointing. Uh, and this is Hypercaris radicator common cats here. Now, people can get a bit challenged by these yellow composites, but I'm here to tell you, they're actually pretty easy. So there's three things to look for in common cats here. I would agree initially when you approach it, particularly in that photo on the right, it looks a little bit like a field of dandelions. There's definitely a similar, an undeniable similarity between this and dandelion. But yeah, three things to look for. First thing is that it has cat's ears on it. Now I've talked about here about the willing suspension of disbelief. Um, what you're looking for, if you look going down the stem and you can see it on that inset photo uh, here and you can see it on the bigger photo, it has these little black tipped ears. I say ears, I'm doing inverted commas if you can see me. Um, I always think of it if you you need to think of the right sort of cat and it's like one of those Egyptian cats that they sort of have in hieroglyphs so very very pointy ears but none of the other uh composites have those ears going up them and it's quite nice to remember because it's called cats here so cats here is the one with ears the second thing to say is the leaves now they're much much thicker than dandelion leaves I always think of dandelion leaves as being quite sort of like a salad leaf i.e if you pick a dandelion on a hot summer's day Within a few minutes, it will start to wilt in your hands because there's not much to it. These are really quite chunky, thick based, quite sort of substantial ones. But when you pick, if you pick them gently at the bottom, you nearly always get three filaments sticking out. And that's the kind of vascular tissue. It tends to kind of leave um, a bit behind it. Uh, and the third thing to say is the hairs are unfought. Now, I know that sounds like an unnecessary technical detail I brought in but it just splits you out from uh, another genus called Leontodon, uh, the hawk's bits, uh, and they, not all of them, but some of them have forked hairs. So just check you haven't got forked hairs. If you have got forked hairs, you need to think twice, but you shouldn't have forked hairs and cat's ears. So it probably means you've gone wrong with your cat's ears. Um, and then finally, just to say about hairiness, this is very misleading in cat's ear because it sometimes is very hairy and sometimes not, depending on what mood it's in. It seems to be a very kind of random thing between different habitats that I've seen it in. So, uh, yeah, don't rely on hairiness. It'll let you down. Right, and then we move into, I've called this Forbes, all the rest. So this is just all the other families shoved together. And I think this is in alphabetical, uh, alpha spaghetical order from now on. So we start off with Dodder, nothing you're going to confuse Dodder with. As I say, it looks like the, the bit of War of the Worlds where that red, I never know quite what it is in War of the Worlds, whether it's a fungus or bacteria or something. I should have paid more taxonomic attention when I was watching the movie. Um, I was going to pretend there that I've read the book, but I haven't read the book, but I have seen the movie. Um, so yeah, Dodder forms these kind of bizarre carpets of, of thread-like leaves. Sometimes you find a little plant in amongst heather, sort of quite delicately, but often uh, it looks like this. <clears throat> I think this photo is on the coastal path in Pembrokeshire, where it's a real kind of stronghold for it. Um, 
it is a parasite, but I think it's, you know, it's been around for ages. It's a native plant, so it's it's kind of pretty much in balance with it. I mean, one of the useful things is it, it can uh, sort of knock the gorse back a bit, which is quite good. Sometimes it's quite upsetting when you see it really swamping the heather, but I think it's all it's all part of nature's plan. Um, keep an eye out for the flowers. You don't need the flowers to identify it, but it's uh, they're very just cool it's like if you were a thread light organism where would you flower and it just they just sort of appear on some of the threads they sometimes come up slightly higher than the rest of the plant but uh yeah i love dodder i just think it's such a weird kind of lifestyle choice really to be a thread which occasionally invades into other plants but you know fair dues to it we now move on to common mouse here now, it's an odd one, common mouse here, here. It tends to kind of indicate slightly high nutrients. So it's not one of the kind of classic flowers you find in this habitat. But, um, yeah, nevertheless, it is one which pops up. I mean, you find it quite a lot in, in improved grassland as well. Um, the thing you can model it up with is stitchwort. And just be, um, be aware that, yeah, they're similar looking flowers, very similar looking. But common mouse here, the leaves look like mouse's ears. I've said here, you know, quite a large mouse. But, you know, they're hairy and they've got a vaguely the sort of flap shape of an ear. The stitchworts, uh, the leaves look like sort of large needles for stitching with, which is how I remember it. So just be aware of that one. But as I say, this is one, uh, it's very much indicative of nutrient improvement. And I think that's probably why it's here, because if this one... Is popping up a lot in heathland it implies the heathland is being nutrient enriched which is not a good thing so it's a lovely plant um, i'm always cautious to ever mention edible plants in case somebody eats you know eats the wrong thing never eat stuff unless you're 100 percent confident about it but if you are a uh, new growth um common mouse at the start of the year can be eaten as a salad plant although i have to say it's slightly unremarkable it just tastes like eating a plant and not in a not in a massively sort of nice way, but it definitely is it is edible. Okay, so now this is one of the classics that I mentioned at the start. So heath bed straw and uh tormentil being the two kind of stalwart species of these habitats. You see here it's down for both heathland and acid grassland. Um it's a bed straw because it's got whirls of leaves common with all the other bed straws so think of cleavers you know which you can stick onto people and so forth and um yeah and it's quite a profuse flower when it gets going it there you know the bed straws can be slightly fiddly to sell apart but really if you're in dry acid grass and heat and it's very very unlikely to be another type of bed straw so as long as you're fairly confident you're in that habitat i wouldn't i'd, I'd be fairly confident at calling it that um, it has quite a nice sort of sweet, sweet smell to the flowers when you get enough of it. And um, in grazed acid grassland, you often won't see it flowering. You'll just find the worlds of leaves. So it's a good one to be able to identify veg vegetatively. Moving on to the rather lovely lousewort, Particularis sylvatica. So very, very divided leaves. Um, they're sort of lobed and divided. And when it flowers, it has these wonderfully lipped leaves. You can see with the new flowers coming out here, it's almost this top petal, which is the first one out. And then it forms this beautiful arch um, over it. And it's got that very cool thing that Mr. when Mr. B comes in, lands on that lower petal. And as it weights it down from this hooded top petal comes either the stamen to deposit the pollen or the stigma to pick it up they tend to sort of one ripens after the other one so very very clever design and i haven't got a photo of it here but it has quite large sort of odd swollen seed pods almost as you'd expect from a large flower like that i always think it's um it's an odd one because the flowers look way too large for such a small plant if you think there are all these sort of really big plants with teeny flowers and this is very much bucking the trend for being a teeny teeny plant uh, with these really quite big flowers on uh there is um oh my goodness there's another lousewort i'm gonna say marsh lousewort but i could be wrong it might be worth looking up so just um yeah be aware of those two it can be a little bit fiddly but once you've got your eye in there they're relatively easy to tell apart less so easy to remember the name of them clearly <laughs> 
Ah, the lovely Heath Milkwort, Polygallus sapillifolia. Uh, and there it is. So the milk, you know, common with all the milkworts, uh, they have these, I love the um, the lower petal, which looks like these sort of raggedy tentacles. It sort of reminds me of a, a sea anemone almost coming out of the bottom of them. And that's across all the um, milkworts. So in terms of, you know, if you're in a heath and you find a milkwort, it's fairly likely to be heath milkwort. Generally, heath milkwort is truer to the colour blue. It's, you do find pink and white ones, but much rarer, whereas common milkwort is much, much common to have all the colours to it. Um, if you're being a proper botanist and being a bit more thorough about it, do just check the leaves at the bottom. And in uh, heath milkwort, they are opposite, and in common milkwort, they're alternate. Uh, and it's a fiddly one to remember that. You just need to think of some way of remembering heath is opposite. Well, I don't know. It's, it's uh, Some of these ones, I have these really clever little, well, I say clever, usually thoroughly juvenile ways of remembering them. But this one, it doesn't sort of, nothing's quite come to me yet. So, uh, yeah, you can think of your own one for that. But, yeah, heath milkwort, opposite leaves at the base. And then Potentilla erecta tormentil. So this is kind of, I'm going to put myself out there and say this is the classic flower of this habitat. Um, so, yeah, I say if you, um, or you're, if you're in a heathland and all you found is grass heather, grass heather, grass heather, you can normally eventually rely on eventually finding a tormentil. Now, this is a member of the rose family. And the significance of that is that the flowers, they are superficially like a buttercup. And I can see why people might look at them, particularly from a distance, and say, oh, buttercup. But the big difference is buttercup flowers, the Ranunculaceae, have these very shiny petals. So you know the whole, um, do you like butter thing? And you shine it on your chin. And generally, everybody likes butter, unless you've got a beard. Um, and that is because of the shiny petals. Now, this one does not, there's no shine on that petal at all. Maybe this is the thing to do on people who don't like butter, because it would work better. So the flowers, um, and I always think the rose family, they are, they're, they're much more blossom-like flowers. I know that's very unscientific, unscientific, but I, I think what I'm getting at is they've just got this sort of really light, um, sort of, well, I, I don't know. I suppose if you think of sort of dried rose petals and confetti, almost this sort of confetti-like. If you think of hawthorn trees and their petals, which it's almost covered in this sort of snow-like material. I suppose I'm saying, you know, they're, they're not the most substantial petals in the world. Um, now, you get different forms of tormentil. Um, so, you know, it's obviously named after the fact that it can be very upright, potentil erecta. But I would say it's often very sprawling, particularly in grazed habitats, because I think the ones which have grown erect have probably been eaten. So either it kind of learns to not grow erect or you're just not seeing any of the erect stems because they've been nibbled off. But don't rely on the erector thing. The second thing to say is about the flowers. So true tormentil will always have four petals, but there is another um, potentilla, potentilla reptans, creeping sankfoil, and that one has five petals. But the two can hybridise with each other. Not only do they hybridise, apparently there's seven different hybrids, because I think it's what's called a fertile hybrid. And obviously with a fertile hybrid, uh, you've got the ability of the plant to back cross with either parent. So it gets very, very murky. So if you find a creeping, sorry, if you find a tormentil, potentil erecta, with five petals, you might have a hybrid. Now, the interesting thing about that is creeping sankfoil is often along pathways and it comes in on sort of walkers' feet and dogs' feet and so forth. And in a way, it's quite a nice sign of disturbance of your heathland. So if you're getting lots of creeping sankfoil or if you're starting to spot the hybrid, it tends to kind of uh, infer there's a kind of an intrusion of amenities and nutrient enrichment into the site. So it's quite an interesting one. But the key thing to remember is pure tormentil, four petals. And I remember that because that rhymes four, tor, mental. See the clever way that I do these things when they work. 
So, moving on to Rumex acetosella, sheep sorrel. Now, there's sheep sorrel and there's common sorrel. Common sorrel is much more plant of meadows and slightly more neutral and enriched habitats. So, um, be aware of that. This sheep sorrel does very well on extremely parched grounds and it can be mini, 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 absolutely teeny on parched soils. Um, and it often, particularly when it goes to seed, it goes very red and you can get uh, what you often see from a long way away is you'll just see a bizarre red patch. It tends to often be where people have removed gorse or they've had a bonfire and they've created an area of bare ground. It definitely likes bare ground. And yeah, that colour can be quite striking. The leaf has these very pointed bases, which sometimes here they're sticking out sideways in this photo, but they can come up, they can curl up the side of the leaf. And sometimes actually the leaf is so small in a droughted thing that it's almost these side bits are the more kind of visual part of it. Common sorrel, they stick downwards and it's a much, it's generally, you know, much larger, it's more rounded leaf. So, um, yeah, just have a look at these bases. And uh, it's a member of the dock family. So, you know, the flowers have a certain similarity to dock, but it's a much, much more um, attractive member of that family and quite sort of striking for, from that point of view. Um, again, here it's down as acid grassland, but you, um, you'll find it in amongst bits of heather, but really it's, 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 it's an indicator of dry and it's often an indicator of bare ground. Moving on to the lovely Vaccinium myrtleus bilberry. So bilberry is its common name in England, but I think it goes under a few, uh, different names as well. I think obviously in America, this is possibly not the same species, but very similar to uh blueberry uh and there's a whole you know family of these vaccinians you have sort of cranberry and crowberry and things like that in it as well this is certainly the most common one particularly in the lowlands where we get a lot less of the other ones uh now one of the quirky things about this is it has chlorophyll in its stems so in the winter you see these weird green stems coming out of the ground and it's very unusual that there's, I mean, it occasionally pops up in spindle, um, but yeah, it doesn't mean it can photosynthesize. Photosynthesize. Oh, I'm going to give up. It can capture the sun's rays. That's how to avoid saying photosynthesis. I did it. Um, yeah, it can do that during the winter, and it's an interesting one because it's like, well, if that's such a good idea, why don't all plants do it? Who knows? Um, the leaves can often be quite ready, particularly when they're young, and I think that's because they're very, very palatable. So it tries, tries to put in a few compounds to um, stop it tasting very well. What I would say is it seems to be right. This is just my personal observation that it's much better at producing berries in upland and northern England sites. In the south, it's very disappointing trying to gather berries, but I've certainly you know, been walking in Snowdonia, and by the end of the day, you feel like you've eaten about a kilo of berries because there's so many produced so don't rely on the berries but um it's very sort of leafy very typical leaf shaped leaf slightly toothed nothing that remarkable about it but look out for the green stems because that's really quite a key thing and then we are now up to the letter v so this must be the end of it veronica the veronica officinalis heath speedwell so in flower, quite a pale speedwell, if you know Germanda speedwell, which sounds like these sort of deep cerise blue flowers. This one's much, much paler. And tooth leaves, and the leaves can be odd structurally. Before it flowers, they can be very sprawly along the ground. And they sometimes, if you, if you sort of rub them between your finger and thumb, they've almost got this slightly sort of sticky, sticky feel to them. Um, the flowers of all the speedwells are very cool. They have this sort of pair of stamens. Um, so just the two um, sticking out on quite a sort of abrupt angle with this single stigma in the middle. And you can see on this picture at the bottom where the petals have come off, you've got the remains of the stigma heading down into the ovaries and what will become the seed pod. Um, but it's good to know that leaf shape because you will often find this knot in flower. So just it's these sort of toothy clusters of slightly sticky leaves. And that's a key one to look for. And that brings it to an end. That's not everything on the list, but it's most things on the list. As I said, 
typically quite a species poor habitat so it's quite a nice one to master some of the grasses can be fiddly because there's quite a few needly ones and they can be quite small and often because i said it's by the nature particularly acid grassland is a very tightly grazed habitat so sadly often you will not get to see whole plants it's there's a lot of detective work of kind of finding bits of plants with their tops bitten off and getting better at recognizing the leaves but because the general species list is quite short, it is a really good one to master.